Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Ambien. Ambien is a sleeping pill. Ambien became available in the United States 1992 and then a controlled release, extended release form of it, came available in 2005. Now both available as generics called Zolpidem, most commonly used sleeping pills here in the United States in the sedative hypnotic family closely related to the benzodiazepines. All of them schedule four drugs which means they have low potential for abuse when they first came on the market. Zopidem was thought to be used only for people who had transient insomnia. Insomnia lasting up to 14 days. But with more experience, it appeared that it was effective, and the FDA gradually lifted the restrictions and then allowed use up to two months, then up to a year. And as of 2005, they say you could use the drug as long as it seems to provide benefit. It always had been said, at least initially, that it would wear out, the effects would wear out after about 14 days. That's obviously false. That's not the case. They last for a long time. They improve sleep, whether you've been taking them for a year or two or three. It all depends on what your particular disorder is. So if you have a sleep disorder, what do you do? Well, after you try everything else, then you could consider cognitive behavioral therapy or melatonin or a sedating antihistamine like Benadryl. A lot of people take antidepressants like doxepin or amitriptyline or especially trazodone. Those are all prescriptions, obviously. Some people, unfortunately, are being given prescriptions for atypical antipsychotics and anticonvulsants for sleep. Those are potentially dangerous, especially because we have these so-called Zs, of which Zolpidem is a prime example. Tens of millions of prescriptions are written every year for these drugs. Six to ten percent of the population uses a sleeping pill. Four million people have used Ambien. It's the most widely prescribed sleeping pill, as I mentioned. And sleeping problems increase in frequency as people get older. And interestingly, sleep problems are twice as common in women as they are in men. The dose, well, in 2013, the FDA said, hey, let's change the dose for women because they metabolize it differently than men. Let's start with a low dose in women, five milligrams. Men, five or 10 milligrams. We prefer five, but 10 is okay for men. And then after a while, if you don't find that you're sleeping better, then you could increase it to 10. You only can take it once at night. You don't get up in the middle of the night and take another. And you especially have to be cautious if you're elderly or if you're debilitated or if you have significant liver disease. You've got to be cautious with this kind of a drug. It should be taken immediately before sleep. Obviously, it's a sleeping pill. You don't take the pill and then drive over to the grocery store. You want to allow seven or eight hours of time before you have to awaken or before you have to do anything that's going to require coordination or mental acuity. You want the drug to be basically metabolized and excreted before you have to do anything. Otherwise, you might suffer from what's known as the clouded brain syndrome, where you have impaired judgment and decreased reaction, maybe while driving a car. What precipitated all of this is they found that eight hours after taking the drug, about 15% of women, one five percent of women against 3% of men, still had significant elevations of the level of zolpidem Ambien in the bloodstream. That's why it was suggested that we cut the dose back a little bit. Now, as far as the extended release or controlled release form, about 60% of the medicine is absorbed quite rapidly, so that if we look between 45 minutes and a couple hours, there is no difference between the controlled release and the immediate release. But the immediate release film dissolves over time and the other 40% is slowly released into the system. Now the FDA says the initial dose for women is six and a quarter milligrams. For men we would prefer that dose, but you could take the 12 and a half milligrams. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine, however, says the six and a quarter milligram pill probably doesn't do much good. It's slower absorption there will be slower absorption if you take it after a meal. If you're taking another central acting depressant, 
if you're taking alcohol or benzodiazepine or you're taking opioid, you, you have to be extra cautious. So you should decrease the dose either of the sleeping pill or of the other medicine that you're taking. We also know that about 70% of people who take these drugs continue to take them for more than a half a year. 40%, unfortunately, are taking them with another kind of central acting drug, a drug like an opioid or benzodiazepine, and that might increase the risk for toxicity. Well, the drug's quickly absorbed. It's absorbed within 45 minutes to an hour. The elimination half-life is about two and a half hours. Lower clearance in women than it is in men, so the levels in women are about 50% again as high as they are in men. The drug is converted into an inactive metabolite and excreted in the urine. There's probably an issue with pregnancy. The drug crosses the placenta, so especially in the third trimester, if a woman's taking the drug, the newborn might be born with respiratory depression and sedation. It doesn't appear to cause birth defects. Problem with lactation also may be present because it crosses into the breast milk. Some people used to say you shouldn't breastfeed if you're taking the drug, but the concentration is so small it does not appear to be an issue. It does appear to be an issue in children. It's not approved for people less than age 18 because they have a higher incidence of side effects, dizziness in about one out of every four people taking the drug and headache and hallucination extraordinarily common. Well, if you're taking the drug, you ought to make sure that you're taking it for the right reason. So if you have short-term insomnia after about seven to ten days, reevaluate. See whether you really need the drug. See if you have some other kind of a comorbid disease. Maybe you have arthritis. Maybe you need to treat the arthritis and it's the pain that's keeping you awake. Or maybe you have an anxiety disorder and you need that appropriately treated. Got to be a little cautious because some people might have a predisposition to either depression or suicidal thinking. We have to be cautious about impaired alertness and altered motor coordination. And caution for some people because they can develop respiratory depression, they, especially if they have COPD or obstructive sleep apnea. Other problems are drowsiness and dizziness and lack of coordination have problems where people can awaken at night, go to the bathroom, and they're not fully coordinated, so they fall down and fracture a hip. Got to be careful of that. The extended release, obviously, you have to be careful driving the next day. And there are cautions against taking the controlled release and driving the next day, or engaging in potentially hazardous activities or activities where full mental alertness is required because we can't really say how long the medicine is going to stay in the system and the impairment can occur even if you're not aware of it. Well, what are the side effects of the pills? Side effects are relatively uncommon outside of the drowsiness and the dizziness and some people get a drug feeling. Some people can complain of headache or blurred vision, double vision. Some people complain of diarrhea or nausea or muscle pains. Some children hallucinate, especially if they take the higher dose. Obviously, it's not for children. Some people find that the drugs worsen depression, worsen anxiety. And as I mentioned before, there's a problem if you have obstructive sleep apnea or if you have COPD, this drug might not be appropriate. Now, another side effect that's made headlines is the amnesia that some people very rarely experience, especially with a high dose and especially when they don't go to bed after they take the pill. And especially if they add the Ambien to either alcohol, the opioids, a tricyclic antidepressant, or a benzodiazepine. Some people develop abnormal complex behavioral activities. So the drug was labeled as with a caution in 2007 for what are known as parasomnias. That means you sleepwalk or eat while you're supposedly asleep or drive or carry on conversations or have sex or go shopping or cook or eat, and you're really not aware of it. Well, those reports are sensational. They're usually in high dose, usually in women, because of the higher concentration. 
And they're usually in people who don't go to sleep right away after taking the pill or if they've combined them with other kind of medicines. Well, there are relatively few interactions with the benzodiazepines other than with the central nervous system depressants. So we have to be cautious for impaired alertness if you're taking a tricyclic antidepressant or an atypical antipsychotic. And we know that the level of ambient is going to be increased in your bloodstream if you take erythromycin, clarithromycin, if you take ketoconazole, and it's going to be decreased. The amount of ambient in your system is decreased if you take rifampin or St. John's wort. It's going to interact with Zoloft and with Ambien, so do have to be careful. The issue of abuse and tolerance and addiction and withdrawal have received a lot of comment, but that's not really an issue. Drugs seem to be very safe. There's some rebound insomnia that people talk about. They say, well, if you take a sleeping pill, you get addicted to a sleeping pill, and then you need the sleeping pill. No, if you have problems sleeping, then you need a sleeping pill because you have problems sleeping. And if you stopped the sleeping pill, it didn't cure the underlying problem, so you still have a problem sleeping. So all of this stuff about rebound insomnia, highly overdrawn. Could you overdose on the drug? If you take it by itself, you could, and you're probably going to have a long sleep. You're not going to be in coma if this is the only drug you're taking. The problem comes in when people take Ambien or overdose on Ambien, and they also have the alcohol or the opioids or the other central acting drugs that act to depress the nervous system. Then potentially, we find somnolence. Some people go into coma or have cardiovascular or respiratory compromise, and some people actually die if they go and abuse the drug in combination with another drug. How does it work? Well, it works on that receptor in the brain we call the GABA receptor. There are a lot of GABA receptors in the brain, and specifically works on the alpha-1 GABA-A receptor. And because it works only in that receptor, it doesn't work as a muscle relaxant, those are the alpha-2 and 3 and 5 receptors. Benzodiazepines, the drugs like Xanax or Lorazepam or Valium, they work on all of the GABA receptors. They don't care. That's why you have more problems, potentially. There's no activity at the dopamine site or the serotonin site. It doesn't work as an antihistamine, anticholinergic. It doesn't seem to interfere with sleep architecture. At most, it might actually increase the deep sleep, the stage three and four sleep, the slow wave sleep. It seems to have inconsistent results on the REM sleep. It doesn't seem to decrease REM sleep. It will shorten your sleep latency, the time it takes to fall asleep, by about 20 minutes over that of a placebo. It's going to decrease the number of awakenings after you go to sleep. It will decrease what we call the wake time after sleep onset. The number of times you wake up in the night, you're going to wake up about 25 minutes less with the pill than with the placebo. It's going to increase the total sleep time by about 30 minutes on average. And it's going to increase the sleep efficiency. Now, we can define insomnia as transient or chronic, but more importantly, we can classify it as some people have problems with sleep onset. Can't fall asleep. About 35 to maybe 50 or 60 percent of the people find that's their major problem. Other people have problem with sleep maintenance. They can go to sleep okay, they just can't stay asleep. That's 50 to 70 percent of the people. That's the most prevalent sleep disorder. And then we have people who complain of non-restorative sleep. Yeah, they get to sleep, but they're still tired when they wake up, and the problems often coexist. That's why the numbers are more than 100%. So if you have a problem with sleep onset, the immediate release Zolpidem or Ambien is okay. That's a good pill. On the other hand, if your problem is sleep maintenance, remember, the drug half-life is only two and a half hours. So not a lot of people are going to be able to sleep through the entire night with just the immediate release ambient. They might need the controlled release ambient. Right now in the United States, about 20 
30, 35% of the prescriptions written are for the immediate release, and 60 or 70% are written for the controlled release. Now, if the controlled release isn't enough to keep you asleep throughout the night, then there are other options. You can go to Lunesta, that's also considered a Z, or you can go to Restoril, that's in the benzodiazepine family. Now, the Z means that they're related to, but they're not the same thing as the benzodiazepine. Zolpidem, obviously, is one of the Z's. The half-life is two and a half hours. Their Zeloplan, that's called Sonata. It's short-acting. That only lasts for about an hour. And then there's the Zopaclone. Zopaclone is Lunesta, and its half-life is six hours. Six hours will get you through the night. Now, they have other forms of Zolpidem that are available. It's a mouth spray, or you can put some under your tongue. That gets a little fancy and unnecessary for the overwhelming majority of people. Now, most people find that their sleep disorders are chronic. And when they're chronic, we have to look for underlying reasons. So we can say you have some predisposing factors to sleep disorders. Some people have a family history. Some people have a lifelong history of poor sleep, maybe related to stress. And then we have the precipitating factors. So you have the predisposing factors. That doesn't mean you have insomnia. That just means you're more likely to develop insomnia. But then you have a precipitating factor. A precipitating factor could be a medical problem, could be an environmental problem, could have a baby screaming in the next room or people banging on the ceiling. Or you could have psychological stress, you're fighting with the spouse. And then we have the perpetuating factors. If we just had the predisposing factors and the precipitating factors, the insomnia would go away when the event resolved. But unfortunately, a lot of people find that once they develop insomnia, then they develop a series of bad habits, behavioral factors, other factors that lead to a vicious cycle. Now, chronic insomnia needs to be addressed because chronic insomnia, if you don't sleep well, that can lead to mood disorders and alcohol dependence and anxiety and depression. It can lead to chronic pain and cardiovascular disease and hypertension and motor vehicle accidents and problems with coordination. So one needs to treat insomnia appropriately and saying that I don't want to take a sleeping pill because it might be habit forming might not be the appropriate way to go. So how do we define insomnia? Well, it's a subjective problem for the most part. But we can say that if when you go to bed you can't fall asleep for at least 30 minutes, or if given enough time you still can't sleep for more than four and a half to five and a half or six hours, you wake up a bunch of times at night, you wake up early in the morning and you can't go back to sleep, you have non-restorative sleep, that's insomnia. And now we know that a lot of people who have chronic insomnia, they think it's a sleep problem, but it's a pathophysiology problem. It's a problem with hyperarousal. It's just the way your brain is hardwired. We find hyperarousal not only during sleep, but even during wakefulness. We find that people who have chronic insomnia have elevated levels of cortisol have increased ACTH, and they have change in the heart rate variability. And if we look at the electroencephalogram, it's different than the people who have normal sleep. Well, the good news about Ambien is, one, it seems to work fairly well. Number two, it's now relatively inexpensive, especially now that it's a generic. You can get it for a cash price of about $50 a month with a coupon, maybe 9 to $25 a month. But the name brand pill, if you get the Ambien, the cash price is going to be about $600. So you want to get the generic. So when we look at Ambien, yes, it's a good sleeping pill. It helps you get to sleep. It doesn't really help you stay asleep. People consider sleeping pills pariahs. But I'll tell you what, if you don't sleep, then you have a problem with daytime productivity and increase in the incidence of heart disease and irritability, you have memory problems, you have weight gain, increased incidence of motor vehicle accidents. So consider appropriate therapy if you suffer, suffer from insomnia.
If you want more information, you can watch the videos that we've done on insomnia and amitriptyline and melatonin. There are a variety of other videos available on this topic and others. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landa.